Hi, my name's David Markham and I'm a technical manager with Tarmac. SUDS stands for Sustainable Drainage System, but is also sometimes read as Sustainable Urban Drainage System. The first is correct, but since it seems likely that a SUDS pavement will be needed more in a city than a small village, the second use isn't entirely misleading. In this video, I'll give an overview of SUDS pavements, but specifically asphalt based systems, because that's what I've worked on in Tarmac. SUDS pavements are ultimately about holding rainfall during thunderstorm events where the excess water would normally overload conventional drainage systems, resulting in potential flooding either at the location or further downstream. So what are the core elements of a SUDS pavement? At the top, you need a structural layer, which is obviously porous. This can be block paving or concrete, but I'm going to talk about asphalt. It has to have a surface course and a binder course, but the thickness depends on traffic loadings. A third porous base layer may be needed for heavier loading applications. Below this comes the layer that the water gets stored in. This is a very open graded stone which is most clearly described as the granular reservoir layer. The GRL also has a structural role in the same way as type one subbase does in a more conventional pavement. But we downgrade the structural contribution of a GRL or its layer stiffness because of its porosity. Below the GRL, you'll generally find either a permeable geotextile layer or an impermeable liner, but this depends on the specifics of the site and the scheme. So these are the basic must haves in a SUDS pavement, and I'll come back to them in a bit more detail later. There are other elements like stanks, which I'll cover as we go through the video as well. I view SUDS pavements as falling into two basic types with subdivisions under these as required to understand how they work. Firstly, there are systems where you want to capture and store rainwater to use it later, almost certainly as grey water for washing cars, watering gardens or flushing toilets. What you have to do in terms of filtering this water is outside my experience, but I'll give some detail later on how asphalt suds can actually help clean runoff water. A water harvesting system will be tanked, that is lined with an impermeable membrane. But it also needs some sort of discharge because as the system gets to capacity, the water level can't simply rise up into the asphalt layer and over top. Secondly, there are store and release systems, which are the classic flood attenuation suds. Here the water is held either to be allowed to slowly soak away naturally into the underlying ground or allowed to discharge into a local water course or drainage system, but in a controlled way. This is done by having a discharge pipe with a flow control valve, which only allows a maximum flow rate out of the pavement and anything over this falling as rain fills up the reservoir layer and is held back. There may be instances where a, a dual discharge system might work, but this takes us properly into hydraulic design, which is out with my direct experience and this video. Suds pavements generally go into low traffic loading environments, so the classic pavement design curves don't really apply you're into sufficient thickness for layability, that's buildability, and durability as much as analytical design concepts. So the thickness of asphalt on a car park type application varies from a total of 100 millimetres up to say 150 millimetres. If you get into proper road design with MSA values, then obviously it'll be thicker, say 240 millimetres of asphalt for a 200,000 standard axle design. And Tarmac commissioned TRL to come up with design curves for different traffic loadings using our porous asphalt mixtures with um, to help with non-standard designs involving heavier traffic. 
The thickness of granular reservoir layer needs to meet both structural and water storage requirements. But 170 mil for a private drive and say 300 mil for a public use pavement would be about typical. On sites with really poor ground conditions, that's low single figure CBRs, then it may be necessary for buildability as much as anything else to import some sort of ground improvement material to go in below the GRL. But any sort of crushed rock capping layer would generally be disregarded in terms of water storage capacity. The granular reservoir layer is a large circa 40 mil single sized crushed rock, which typically delivers voids in the upper 30 or low 40%. It needs to be crushed rock to guarantee a degree of interlock, which links directly to buildability, which we'll come back to in a bit. The asphalt layers are designed to live in a damp environment, but never actually sit in water. The water goes down into the GRL for storage. So durability is a key consideration in their design. Aggregates with good affinity with bitumen are preferred, and it may be necessary to use an adhesion agent in with the bitumen to give high performance. Tarmac uses porous 32 mil base and 20 mil binder course mixes. These typically deliver around 20 to 25 percent voids. Between a conventional two layer and three layer system, it does make sense to have surface course plus a thick binder course, so something like 30 plus 90 millimeters. In this instance, you'd do the binder course in 32 mil because it's 90 mil thick. We've developed enough experience in Tarmac with the base and binder mixes to follow broadly a recipe approach. So we reserve the more complicated design process for surface courses, which can be six mil or 10 mil stone size, depending on end use. Six mil is predominantly used for private drives, with the 10 mil covering most public space applications. We design the surface courses with circa 15 to 20% air voids, but permeability is about interconnected voids, not just air voids, so aggregate shape is also important. This is why we measure hydraulic conductivity on every surface course design we do, and routinely as part of larger schemes as the surfacing materials are installed. We do hydraulic conductivity testing on lab prepared slabs or in situ using British standard method DD229. This is called a falling head permeometer that works by measuring how long it takes for two litres of water in a perspex cylinder to flow th out through the specimen that the equipment is securely placed down onto. During this, the water level drops from about three feet above the surface down to one foot. We're applying a pressure at the top of the test surface, which is admittedly bigger than what happens even as heavy rain falls on a car park surface. But using high heads or pressures is fairly standard for permeability testing and makes for a simple and robust test. In this case, permeability is expressed in millimetres per hour and a typical surface course number is around eight to ten thousand. To put this in context, the heaviest 24 hour rainfall in the UK was 344 millimetres up in Cumbria. For shorter rainfall events like thunderstorms, a one in 100 year event might be something like 60 millimetres of rain falling in an hour. The biggest challenge for Sud's surface courses is in reality toughness, because fairly obviously, if you make just about any material more voided, then some or all measures of strength go down. To get round this and deliver a material that can stand up to turning and manoeuvring vehicles, then we use a polymer modified binder in our SUDS surface courses. 
The hydraulic design of a sod's pavement is a specialist area and needs decisions about the design storm event, how much rain falls and how quickly, as well as knowledge of the permeability of the soil underlying a site. Clearly, if a site is on really dense clay, then it isn't going to allow much water to soak away into the subgrade now or after you construct a suds pavement there. The hydraulic designer needs to know the capacity of the granular reservoir layer. A well designed and controlled GRL can be conservatively taken as 30% void space. There are generic open graded stone specifications, but sources might not have had the voidage determined, so it's advisable to stick with proprietary GRLs if possible. If you live in one of the areas coloured black on this map, then you probably know more about rainfall than I do, and maybe also about the need for stormwater attenuation. Sites on a slope present an obvious problem with water because water runs quite quickly downhill. This applies as much to a big car park site as to a steeply sloping driveway. Water in the GRL will flow to the lowest point on the site unless the hydraulic design incorporates stanks. These are basically bulkheads or walls built into the GRL that divide it into cells to make sure that water falling at the top of the site sinks down into the GRL and then gets held there and can't immediately start flowing down to the bottom of the slope and causing flooding at the low point of the site. If your site is sloped and on low permeability ground, then you probably need controlled discharge valves that allow the top cell to drain slowly into the next cell down before eventually getting to the site just discharge point at the bottom. Think the leaking lock gates on a canal staircase, if you like. Stanks are something that needs looking at by a qualified hydraulic engineer. Suds pavements can also be designed to take runoff from impermeable surfaces. This could be from an adjacent heavy vehicle access route done in impermeable asphalt or from buildings and directed into the GRL layer. Clearly both introduce an additional water load in a storm event and need careful hydraulic design. Tarmac worked with a, a leading UK university involved in SUDS research to build test pavements for the purpose of investigating both pavement clogging and treatment of water that was deliberately dosed with heavy metals and oils as well as road dust. This simulated two years of pollutant loading and rainfall. The test rigs were then cut open and samples taken from the various layers to investigate what um, was inside, as well as samples taken from the discharge of the test rigs to measure the water as it came out the bottom. And these tests identified that the surfacing retained over 97% of the applied sediment, over 99% of oil and grease, and over 98% of most of the heavy metals applied in the water onto the surface. You wouldn't describe the water coming out at the bottom of the rigs as pure, but the heavy metal levels were within World Health Organization limits for drinking water. It's believed that granular reservoir layers grew their own little microbial communities that may have digested the oils and the grease applied at the surface. Installation of the granular reservoir layer is probably most influenced by whether the system is tanked using an impermeable membrane. If it is, then great care needs to be taken to avoid puncturing the membrane as the GRL is placed. Laying the asphalt is through conventional pavers and rollers. The main issue to contend with is the mobility of the GRL. Running heavy construction plant and delivery wagons on a very single sized unbound layer can be problematic. So it's fairly standard to place a thin layer of smaller 20 to 5 sized concrete aggregate at the top of the GRL. 
this knits into the surface voids just at the surface and helps to stabilize the layer. E even then you need tracked pavers and awareness from delivery drivers of the need to move around carefully across the GRL as they bring in asphalt materials and other construction materials. One issue that does need to be acknowledged is with staged construction, as frequently found on roads through new housing developments. Installation of suds driveways on a scheme is straightforward, but if the hydraulic design for the site needs the access road to be porous, then that is a challenge. The developer wants to run all traffic on the binder course during the construction phase and only install a surface course once all heavy traffic movements have ceased. You can't do that with a porous binder course, so you need an alternative strategy, be it a dense binder course that is then punctured before laying the porous surface course or another approach. In terms of aftercare, detritus or dust on impermeable roads will gather on the surface and migrate to curb lines or gullies. But in suds pavements, the fine material is quite happy to fall down into the open structure. The university research I mentioned before showed that clogging by dust and grit is generally only superficial, i.e. the material sits at the surface and doesn't sink down beyond the top of the surface course. So a cleaning regime is able to maintain good overall permeability. And remember, on a large area like a car park, any small areas with a reduced hydraulic conductivity will be able to shed water to nearby areas. This isn't the intention of suds, but is the reality of something which, as we've seen, is installed with a much higher initial flow rate capacity than is needed even for the heaviest storm events. Cleaning with a conventional road sweeper is generally discouraged. What's needed is plant that can loosen the material at the surface and remove it by suction. An example of cleaning is from an eight year old car park outside a large DIY store. Due to spillages, most likely from bagged products being brought out by customers, some of the parking bays near the store entrance were completely clogged. Hydraulic testing after cleaning these areas showed that the um, hydraulic conductivity was restored to between three and 4,000 millimetres per hour. So probably less than at installation, but still a relatively high number compared to what it needs to deliver to work as a suds pavement. It's important to note that the car park was still performing as a whole because the great part of the site still had good hydraulic conductivity and the bays simply shed water to the more permeable parts until they were cleaned. It's worth noting that Tarmac has BBA certification for our asphalt suds offering, which is called Ulti Suds. This covers it as a full system, as well as the asphalt layers on their own on top of a granular reservoir layer. So in conclusion, Porous pavements and storm water attenuation are going to be with us for the foreseeable future. The UK continues to build new commercial and residential developments, which combined with greater risk of storm events via global warming, make for an ongoing demand. Whilst not the only solution in that hydraulic engineer's toolkit, it makes sense in many situations to build water storage capacity into large spaces like car parks and even roads and asphalt suds are an attractive option due to their speed of installation and long-term performance. Thanks for listening.